So thank you everyone for joining us today on another session we have. Uh, today we are going to focus on unlocking the value in our supply chains. They say that uh, marketing and sales will tell you about the food and how nice the food is. But logistics will put the food on the table. Your customer or your family is able to afford that food. Today, we are, going, we are joined by Kasten Schubert from South Africa. Kasten is a director for Transnova Africa, a leading company in logistics solutions uh, technology. He will tell us more about it. And Kasten says that it is easy to save 10% from your supply chain that then increase sales by 10% meaning during this time where we have a pandemic where cash is tight revenues are low profitability is properly hit supply chain is where there's a latent value that we can lock for quick wins for the business Kasten, i would like to welcome you now uh, to take over the presentation just some ground rules please use the chat box to tell us about yourself where you are dialing from and your expectations about uh, this presentation and use the Q&A box to ask questions as the as Kasten presents. Ask as many questions as you can. Ask them instantly when it comes to your mind, and we shall revisit them at the end of the of the web of the presentation. Also, if you really really want to speak, you will raise your hand, and after we go through the Q&A box, we will give you a chance uh, to speak and uh, ask your question or comment. Kasten, karibu sana. Thank you, Bernard, and uh, good evening and uh, welcome to everybody. And thank you for investing the next hour and a half with us. Uh, look forward to taking you through some thoughts around unlocking the latent value in your supply chain. Um, Bernard uh, spoke about the marketing and, 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 and sales, um, marketing and sales earlier on. Yeah, pretty much marketing and sales from Bernard and Richard talking about uh, how it's easy to get the 10%. I wouldn't say it's easy, but I think there is a way. And I think the other thing is uh, the four key takeouts to get them done in an hour is probably also a good marketing uh, spin, but we're going to give it a good go to get there. Um, quite a lot to cover in the next hour. We're going to move at a reasonable pace uh, to get through things. If um, there's any appetite post this, we'll gladly do a deep dive into any one of the uh, individual sections at a later stage. And if you just arrange it through Bernard, that would be great. So uh, going to kick, kick right off, uh, just a little bit of context around transport and in particular, I suppose, transport uh, in the East African Territory. Some, some, just some interesting uh, facts and figures and statistics. Uh, the average distance between major cities in Africa is uh, 4,100 kilometers versus Europe. It's 1,300, North America 2,200, South America 3,400. Um, also, Quite interesting. We've got quite a fragment set of trades, a fragmented set of trade zones. 16, I think, all in all, um, for 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 the African countries, uh, and significantly less in in other territories. And um, also in terms of just the environment that we operate in, I think we 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 faced with a with a large uh, number of constraints, both both hard and soft. By hard constraints, I mean in infrastructure, road infrastructure, rail infrastructure, port infrastructure, and warehousing availability. Although it must be said in the last 20 years, there's been significant improvements in that front. I say in Kenya in particular, if you take a look at the SGR, the investment in the port, uh, ring road going in, so, so a lot of investment happening there, which is uh, gonna help that, uh, help that challenge. And then the soft constraints, uh, largely being the sort of bureaucracy, uh, red tape, um, dare I say, uh, bribes, other types of things that that that, that hit, uh, hit hit us in the in in the, in the sort of course of doing business and tra and transportation. Um, also, another another challenge that we faced with a lot, uh, particularly in the East Africa, is the the imbalance in 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 trade flows. So a lot of product going westwards, i.e., from the ports into the hinterland and not so much going eastwards. And why is that important? Well, that's important because um, your transport rates, you're pretty much gonna be paying for the kilometers both there and back is sort of certainly from the port side. And if you're not, and if you, if you can collaborate and find opportunities 
to with somebody to uh, carry on or piggyback on their backload if there's a good opportunity for uh, cost reduction and savings. So what does this then all mean? So normally, globally speaking, logistics makes up 13% of GDP of a country's GDP on average. Um, more efficient countries are kind of in the eight to 9%. Uh, South Africa, where I'm currently speaking to you from, is at 11, 11 odd percent. And um, if we take a look at kind of East Africa, we couldn't really find some uh, stats around that, but uh, probably 15 to 15 to 40%, depending on what you read um, and where you go for. And that's largely driven by a couple of factors. The one is obviously the long distance of, 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 of travel um, and two, not, not being able to have, have, have return loads as well. So that also drives it. And three, when you look at it as a, as a percentage uh, of GDP and that it also depends on, on, on the actual GDP as, as well. So why am I sharing all of this with you when we're talking about transport strategies and the likes of that? Well, it's to say to you that logistics efficiency, planning and execution must be a key focus area in your business. Because by the looks of things, we've been dealt a tough hand here in Africa to deal with. Um, and already just those, those five uh, slides that we've gone through do highlight some of the complexities and the cost drivers in the business. And many people that I engage with, uh, I've asked them, well, what is your strategy in your logistics space uh, for the next year? And they'll turn around and say to me, Carsten, we're hoping to reduce inventory. We hope to reduce the transport cost. We hope to get out, out of uh, on time in full up. Uh, all those kind of things. And you know what? Hope is not a strategy. Okay. So uh, it is really time, the, time that companies, uh, uh, companies took control of their supply chain, didn't worry about hope. Uh, and if you take a look at in terms of the, the, the costs that of, of logistics and supply chain make up in, in your area, in your business, and let, let's pick it at 15 to 20%, it's a significant number that requires a key core focus in your business. And if it isn't something that's enjoying dedicated focus, I would, I would strongly suggest it's something that you consider. So that then leads me perhaps a nice backdrop into saying, well, uh, if we consider we need to be quite, take our logistics uh, strategy quite serious, then why don't we start looking at a strategy? So how do we develop a strategy? How do you go about developing a logistics strategy and what is kind of, kind of the right way to do it? And why do we want to do it? Besides that which we've said, if you take it, you look at your own business the same way as you look at a GDP of a country, what percentage of your turnover is uh, uh, spent on logistics? So maybe we've got a couple of CFOs in the room who are close to those numbers. If you would like to just type those into the chat box, that would be great. But I'm gonna guess that you, you're probably spending anywhere between 10 to 30, 40%, uh, possibly more uh, of, of your turnover on, on logistics. I think your big cost would be logistics and, 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 and people, and then uh, obviously some, some energy and consumption. And largely also depends on the value of the product that you're moving around as well. Sort of a relatively low value product, uh, heavy, large, bulky would, it, would attract percentage wise or higher. So if we then said, well, for purposes of this discussion, let's say you're a company that turns over $100 million and we agree that you're gonna be spending about eight to 15% of, of your turnover on transport, transportation. That means you're spending between eight and 15 million rand, uh, million dollars on transport. If we then said, well, what if you could get a 10% savings of that? And that's where Bernard's 10% uh, came in earlier on. Then you're looking at about $800,000 to $1.5 million savings right there. Now in business, you know that the savings just doesn't come from itself and you don't get it, it's got to be a focus, you've got to have a strategy, and you've got to go down and grind it out every single day to get that savings. Keep in mind, though, that when people, when I ask them, what is your transport strategy, some people turn around and say, no, we're going to go for RFQ or RFP. Well, you know what, a RFP or RFQ is part of a strategy, it isn't your strategy. Okay, important to realize that a transport has got costs, it costs him a certain amount of money to buy a vehicle, to fuel a vehicle, to pay a driver, replace tires, etc. Okay, so you can only get a certain amount from the transporter. The rest of that latent value that's in your supply chain, you've got to look at creating a frictionless synchronization of interdependent activities within your supply chain. So what do we mean? Right from how you get the order to how you make minimum or, or economic order sizes 
to your customers. What is your policy around that? How you, how you plan your transport? What is your transport strategy? What type of vehicles do you have? What size payloads? Um, we've spoke about minimum order quantities. What is your sales promise? Is it today for today, today for tomorrow, today for three days time? What is your transporter or your carrier strategy that you're dealing with? How's production and warehousing's slotting in in terms of uh, are you able to go there and do nighttime loading so that in the morning you can dispatch and get into Nairobi before the jam sets in? Um, are, are you changing your mindset around that? Or are you saying, well, you know what, the, the team only arrives at 7 a.m. so we can start loading from 7.30 and bang, when you dispatch from your, your facility, you straight into the jam. So those are the kind of things where there's within your supply chain, um, you know, there's, there's latent value there. In terms of your customers, how long are the customers taking to offload the vehicles? Are they taking a day or is there some form of urgency or some form of incentive for them to offload? And are you even measuring or managing how long it takes your customers to offload? And are you managing a cost to serve of those customers? The ones who off you, offload you quicker should theoretically be cheaper to serve than the ones that don't. And it all depends on how you rate and, and how you structure it and what are you measuring and reporting in your supply chain. So in terms of, of, of developing a strategy, we've got a, a simple process that, that we talk the, the holistic sort of uh, integrated approach to logistics management. And as you can see with the, the diagram there, it starts with the strategy. Don't go a procurement event until you've got a strategy. It's like going shopping without a shopping list. You're going to come home with the wrong stuff or you're going to bought too much stuff or you're going to have, have, have forgotten something. So we talk strategy. Once you've got your strategy clear, you know what you want to go out to, to, to market for. Then you go shopping to procurement. And once you've got that right, then you start that process of doing execution manage well. So you want to plan, you want to execute, you want to make sure you pay your transport as well. And while in that time have total visibility of what's happening in your supply chain and look for those collaboration opportunities. So what's the, the starting point for developing a transport strategy? Well, clearly you've got to take a look. What is the business strategy? And by that, where are you, where are you focused? Are you, are you local in your country? Do you have a 20% export criteria? Are you growing? Are you shrinking? Are you manufacturing locally? Are you importing? What is your, what is your minimum hurdle rates? Once the, the business strategy is understood, what is the sales and, and marketing strategy? So by that, we mean, well, what is your sales promise? Are you promising if you order today by two o'clock, you'll get tomorrow by tomorrow by 1600? Or are you promising if you order today, you'll get by next week? Are you saying that you can order eaches or do you have a minimum order quantity of a pallet or a full truck load? Um, because all those type of things that dictate backwards where your inventory is kept. Obviously, if you've got a today for today, you've got to keep your inventory very close to source, close to the market. Uh, if you've got a, a, a far softer, you can keep your inventory further back, closer to the production facilities, and then equal what size vehicles you're going to use. Um, and then what are your service targets and penalties? And that then informs your distribution strategy. So what is your road rail mix? What is your equipment size? What is your fleet utilization? Are you going to buy your own fleet? Are you going to lease fleet? Are you going to play in the ad hoc market? Are you going to go multimodal? All those type of things start to come. So your distribution strategy supports the business. And it's a bit of an iterative process because uh, let's take Kenya, for example, uh, SGR came into play. Do you then say, well, what does SGR from the supply chain point of view allow us to do and can it influence our sales and marketing strategy? Do we need to sell better? Can we offer cheaper? Uh, can we offer a, a, a better service offering? Or if you could deliver with drones, for argument's sake, in the medicine, uh, in the medicine field to outlying areas, can you change your lead times? So where are the areas to, to unlock that latent value that Bernard put out there so, so eloquently? So there are three areas we focus on, strategic, tactical, and operational areas and looking at where the areas of opportunity are. Inbound and outbound synergies, you've got to be doing that. Okay, and it's not a, a, applicable in all instances. Sometimes the truck that comes in is a, is a bulk liquid truck and sometimes the product goes out is, is product on, on pallets, no match there. But where you've got equipment types coming in and out, that is, is a key, key, key focus area and a key point. Um, we have seen it time and time again where inbound is run by the factory and outbound is, is the transportation is run by sales and distribution and the two uh, and those synergies are completely missed. 
Uh, we've done some good work in Tanzania. We, we found a one for, match, uh, one for one match, done the same in Rwanda uh, with significant, significant savings, as you can see on those charts. The other is network changes. Where are your warehouses? Where are your distribution centers? Um, when you've done a merger or an acquisition, how do you consolidate the network? Then going down to procurement. So again, are you procuring within your strategy? Have you gone to market? How, how do you procure? Is it on ad hoc rates? Is it on a fixed and variable rate? Is it on a two-year contract, a five-year contract? What about equipment configuration? And, and interestingly enough, you know, are, are you supplying in the most economic order quantity? Uh, we've done some work in Kenya not too long ago where a customer has bought product uh, or, or shipped product to, to their customers in 10 ton loads. Um, and when we said, but hang on a second, this doesn't make sense. This is a bulk commodity. Why are you sending it in 10 ton loads? The answer that they said was, well, our customers want it in 10 ton loads. We said, but surely they could take it in a 30 ton load. No, the customer wants it 10 ton loads. We went to market, went to see the customers. We said to the customers, hey, you're ordering three of these 10 ton trucks a day. Why do you order them like that? No, no, no. The supplier only sends in 10 tons. Would you take a 30 ton? Oh, absolutely we would. It would make our lives easier. So sometimes it's just some legacy uh, thinking that keeps things in place and, and drives inefficiency. And that right there is latent value. Put it onto a bigger truck, lower distribution cost, dilution of cost. And then how do you contract for efficiency? I've got a nice little slide that's gonna take you through that uh, and show you a really good example of that. And that's, I think we are about two slides off from that one. And then your optimal daily planning. Are you planning every single day, if you've got 100 loads to go out, when you put your head on the pillow that tonight, do you know that you've done those at the lowest possible cost on that day? And are you leaving it to people or are you using technology to help you enable that process? Then elimination of processing areas where your controls are not good and your controls are not in place. Transposers are funny. If you overpay them, they generally, you don't hear from them. If you short pay them, the CFO, the chairman, the MD, everyone else in the business knows about it. So, uh, uh, and then the last part is admin and, and planning. So how many people you have in the planning process? And unfortunately, when people are looking to take out costs like now during these COVID times and these tough times, so where are we gonna take out costs in the process? Ah, let's start in that admin and planning. Let's do it, you know, get the people who are there to work a bit harder and let's say, let's say goodbye to Richard. We no longer need him. But that's the smallest part of the savings. The big part of the savings is, is, is up in the, in the strategic and tactical space. So keeping that, that in mind, when you're looking at your transport strategy, it's actually quite a systematic approach when, you, when you're starting to unpack it. The first thing that we advocate when you go there is establish what are the ad hoc rates for your transport lanes. So break your transport up into lanes and go to market, go to the transporters. So run an RFQ, go to market, get back the rates. Why do we say that? Because one, uh, road transport is always the the door-to-door -door option as opposed to multimodal. Generally, uh, traditionally in East Africa has been the, 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 the cheapest form, quickest way to get to get product there. And if somebody has got a backhaul load, guess what? You're not gonna beat that backhaul load. Okay, so know what's out there, know what the capacity is. Then run a check on rail, multimodal, what can you ship if you're going into the lakes areas, what can you ship on, 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 on boats or barges and uh, do a full end-to-end -end costing, i.e. the first mile, last mile added to, added to your multimodal. Then uh, take a look at dedicated fleets, your own fleets, dedicated fleets, do that analysis. Someone in the business is going to ask you, why don't we own fleets? Yeah? Why don't we, uh, like Dengoti owns a lot of, of vehicles, is that the right strategy, is that not the right strategy? Look at that option. Then once you've got all that information back, analyze, finalize your strategy, and then go into final rate negotiations. Now, if you look at the map on the right, you'll see that we've got some purple lines and you'll see the purple dotted line is, is long distance transport. Um, and that we would say, typically you probably wanna be going for long distance transport on ad hoc. Uh, and possibly those people might have a return load of coffee or, or something else coming back from, from a region. Um, and then you'll see around, uh, around uh, Mombasa and Nairobi, we've got a bunch of small little blue lines, which is about a dedicated fleet. So what is the logic and the methodology around a dedicated fleet? Well, let's, let's unpack that. Let's use an example for you. I'm gonna choose Mombasa, one of my favorite, my, my favorite cities uh, on the coast. And I've got, a little, I've got a warehouse and I've got to transport some product out there. I've got three loads to do on the day. 
and I'm going to get those three loads out with three different transporters, transporter A, transporter B, and transporter C. Each one of those transporters, I'm going to pay $200 to do that load. So for the day to get my loads out, it cost me $600. I then said, but hang on a second, Bernard has uh, uh, arranged this webinar. They talked about vehicles, and I've learned there that trucks have got fixed and variable costs. Um, and let's assume for this discussion that those are equally split. So of the $200 uh, dollars for, the, for, the, for the load, $100 is fixed cost, which talks to the bank repayments, which talks to the insurance, potentially to the wages of the driver on the vehicle as well, if he's paid on a fixed basis. And then $100 of that load is on a variable basis. So that, is, that largely covers the fuel, the tires, the oil, possible toll fees, etc. I then say, okay, well, let me think about this a bit differently. I'm going to apply a transport strategy, do a little bit of extra work here. I'm going to say, okay, um, I'm going to do those three deliveries with one vehicle, provided the traffic and the jams aren't too bad. I can do, I can do three deliveries a day, one in the morning, very early in the morning, one at lunchtime and one in the afternoon. So if I'm doing those three deliveries in a day, I go speak to my transport and I say to him, so I know that you have a fixed cost and variable cost. I'm going to pay you $100, $100 for your fixed cost once and then I'm gonna pay you $100 for the variable. So the first load I'm paying you $200 for, for your fixed cost and your variable, but because I've paid your fixed costs, the second and the third load are only at $100 because I'm covering your variable costs. Well, what have you done? You've spent $400 on the same deliveries versus $600. So you've saved 33% right there, just in terms of a strategy, thinking about how you transport and in terms of on those local type deliveries, short haul deliveries, contracting differently as opposed to a rate per as, 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 a, as a rate per load. Clearly, you've got to make an investment in planning ability. You've got to make some phone calls to, 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 uh, to your customers to have take them in different slots. But the latent value is sitting there waiting for you to unlock it. And that's just one of those points. Another, an, another point is uh, if, if you are anybody's uh, exporting goods on the inside, yeah, CIF or FOB type INCO terms, the, the one terms, the FOB, beautiful. You, you, you find a supplier, he says, don't worry, I'll get it delivered to your door and this thing's going to cost you $8,000. Easiest way to do it. Also happens to be the most expensive way. If you, however, say, don't worry, get it to, for me to a port in China or in Turkey, I'll arrange the logistics from there. And you can see with the, with the triangle at the bottom how costs go up as we are walking through every single part in that supply chain. Um, and if you understand what all those costs are, and each one of those costs, you can get a 5 or 8% discount. And the sum of those, you can easily save probably 20 to 30% by doing that. And in fact, we've done that with a large telco uh, company based here down in South Africa. So key messages, right? Understand what is your logistics cost in your business. Look at your strategy. Look at, 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 look at the interdependencies within your supply chain. Remember, you're going to go to market. You're going to get a good rate. You're going to get better rates there. But there is additional value. What is that additional value? How are you going to contract differently in the business um, to, to unlock that value? So that, that, that's very important from a, strategy, from a strategy point of view as well. So the value is there. The next component I want to share a bit about is rates benchmarking. The amount of times I get asked for rates benchmarking is insane. A lot of people want to understand, and it's, it's often seemed to be quite a difficult place to, uh, that, that people are not clear on the rates benchmarking. We spend a lot of time thinking about this, and, and, and the best way we can go back to is start, start simplistically. There's, there's two ways to benchmark, internally within your business and then externally. So in your business as well, are you benchmarking? So what do I mean by internally? Very simple way is take Take the rates that you're paying per equipment type. So let's say you're running on a triaxle, a triaxle 30 ton vehicle, uh, and you, you're delivering to 70 different destinations. Get all those rates, then divide the, the rate by the, the, the kilometers and you get a cost per kilometer, a CPK. Right, I'm gonna then show you what you do with that. So if you take a look at this graph over here, um, over, over left, we've, on the left-hand side, we've got a dollars uh, per kilometer, the cost to run that vehicle. Now, remember, you're now bringing everything back to a lowest cost uh, denominator to something that you can measure with. So I'm, I'm now knowing that my vehicles run at a certain cost per kilometer. What we've done over here, and uh, these are current rates uh, for happen to be in the cement industry uh, in different countries. 
So let's say you have a presence in a few different countries in the DRC, Tanzania, Kenya, and Rwanda. And you can see there for different distance groupings, you already can start to see the different player. And you can then start to drill down. Now the DRC you can see is very high. Well, why is that? Well, it's because it's the DRC. Up and above that, the route that, uh, that that's on is on a, on, on a, on a toll road, a, an official toll road that's very expensive. And there's a couple of unofficial toll stops. I think you probably all know what I mean when I say that. Um, and that gives a good point. So when you start to collect enough data and you go to some of your industry peers, you get a better spread like you see on this graph over here. So this graph is in rands, same principle applies. As you can see, the shorter your distance, the higher your cost per kilometer is. And as you go longer, the, the, the cost reduces. So what we've done here, first time whenever somebody asks us to do a benchmarking, we, we link their, uh, we populate their, their uh, CPKs against our database, and we just start to get a good feel. And where the outliers are, that's the first point to drill down and look into. So a very good pace to start your, your uh, rates benchmarking and try and understand where you are and reach out to your industry peers. Uh, fortunately, in East Africa, a lot of work on the same equipment types, predominantly the, the triaxial trailer um, that's out there. And again, around benchmarking rates, I just cannot overemphasize the amount of value that's lying in your total supply chain. So don't just look to the transporter. Yeah, is your warehouse loading quick? Is your customer offloading you quick? Have you packaged the, the right size? Are you loading to the op optimal payload of the vehicle? Are you using the right types of vehicles? Are you loading or offloading quickly? That's where that value sits. So when you, if you take one thing away from today, please take away from, yes, you can do get, get a better rate from the transporters depending on how you contract. But this particular uh, drawing here is where the true value lies. So all that list is, is not gold. It's not about the rate. It's about how you manage the interdependencies in your supply chain. And that's where you're going to unlock a lot of the value. So running a streamlined procurement event, we talk about it. We've, we've got the strategy done. And we say we're going to go now to, to get some, some rates. So what do you do? And this is perhaps where Bernard is far better positioned than I am. But typically, there's three types of ways you look at it. Is it an RFI, a request for information, an RFP, or RFQ? So to me, RFI, yeah, you want to know who's out there. RFP, you only do is where you're looking for professional services or it's non-commodity work. Transport is commoditized. Go for an RFQ. The more work you spend up front, the clearer you are knowing the late, the, the, the lane, the, the amount of volumes, the insurance values, et cetera, the better you are and, you, and your RFP is going to be. Because what happens is if your RFQ is vague, okay, the transporters will cost for uncertainty. So, well, we're not sure on this. Okay, well, add 2%. We're not sure on that. Oh, add 3%. All right. So, we want to get away from that. So, again, before we go to, to do the shopping, remember, we're linking it to the business strategy, the sales strategy, and the distribution strategy. And one of the best ways to then, from a thought process point of view, is to adopt one of Stephen Covey's seven habits, okay? And that is begin with the end in mind, right? So what do I mean about that? I mean about when you're going out to RFQ, what type of transport contract are you gonna to give to the transporter? Now, I know a lot of the contracts that you probably have are two pages, which is very light. You probably wanna spend a bit more time getting clarity on it. Why do I say that? I came across a transporter once who said to me, Carsten, I cannot negotiate the price of a contract up, of a contract that I haven't won. Okay, so what does that mean? That means they go in low, play on the vagaries and, and, the, and the missing information, and then raise the price post. And that irritates, in, in, irritates the client. Uh, and uh, so to get away from that, be clear up front. So what do we talk about? So even go so far as to draft the, the basic contracting principles. So how are you going to draft for insurance? Uh, force majeure. Well, that was a clause that no one really worried about up until about uh, four months ago, isn't it? I'm pretty sure that most of you went, went running for your force majeure clauses um, in your contracts across the board. So contract for that in. What about non-solicitation clauses, intellectual property? Um, be clear with your transporters before you go to RFP, what is your on-time for loading expectation, on-time for deliveries, communications? Um, how do you con uh, capture the value? So I'll take you back to that deliveries of those three $200 uh, options. You know, are you contracting on a fixed and variable basis or are you contracting on an ad hoc basis? You know, are you contracting on a load per rate with a second load incentive? 
Are you contracting on a first right of refusal? And all of that is informed by your strategy. But again, if you clear and, and you're gonna, your strategy is gonna be different for different parts of the country. And the way you go to the market is gonna be different. So the way you're gonna go to run your RFQ for, for, for city to, for within the city work is gonna be one way. The way you're running your, your long distance is gonna be different to maybe your inbound. Um, what are you doing around your right vehicle type? I spoke earlier on about the, the, the customer of ours who was doing 10 ton loads. Well, do you want to be getting 30 ton loads? Do you want to be looking at lightweight uh, trailers that potentially could get you 32 two tons? And if you're getting through 32 tons, you don't want to be paying the, the transporter per ton because then he just captures the value. So you want to be paying the transporter per trip so you get the value. So the closer you are to that payload, because it's going to take you time and effort. You've got to, you've got to ask your customers to change the order profile. You've got to load differently. You've got to secure differently. So do you want to add double drivers? And then, you know, uh, how do you contract with rates management? Take the grayness out. How do you contract for fuel escalations, for annual escalations? How do you manage around claims that the, the truck has an accident? You know, all that in play. Uh, capacity, you can see on the graph on the right. Uh, average loads per day for this particular customer is four loads per day. Well, maybe you want to secure that four loads a day so you're not dialing for diesel every single day. So you want to have a form of a dedicated fleet. How do you manage that? On what rate basis? And then everything above the shaded line is going to be on an ad hoc basis where you're then dialing for diesel. You're then trying to get that in. And how do you make sure that you get the lowest cost rates when you're doing those? So all of that you need to start thinking about when you uh, starting to, to put your... Uh, RFQ together. How do you contract for visibility, feedback, for image? You know, if you if you're contracting, it's a mobile billboard. If you're going for extended period of contract, get your transporter to 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 paint it in your your vehicle in your colours. Is CO2 or CO2 emissions a big thing in your life? Um, so those are the types of things that that you should be putting in to the business. So that's largely around running an RFQ. Think about how you draft the contract. Be clear out there. Take the grayness out. People are going to respond to a very clear contract plus, uh, and and you'll get you'll get sharper rates, and it ties back into your transport strategy because you're now shopping for how how your strategy and how you're going to deliver to your network. Good. I hope I'm still keeping you. I know I'm moving at a pace. I am conscious of time. Still got a bit to go through. So the other question I get asked a lot is. What are the difference between the different supply chain technologies that are out there in the logistics space? A number of technologies can become very confusing. Let me share with you a little bit around around the technologies that are in that are out there. So the first part of the uh, and again, I'm starting from the tactical side or strategic side and going to move down to tactical and operational. So on the strategic side, there's a, there are products that are do network modeling, center of gravity, cost to serve. So effectively, you create a digital twin of your business. Where should I have warehouses? Which customers should I serve? What should my flow path be? One of these type of products is a product called Llamasoft that does this very well. And you can model your product flow path. So what if I get from India through Mombasa versus uh, India through Dar es Salaam or China through Dar es Salaam to, to, to where I am? So that's your kind of flow path. Where, in, where should I keep my inventory, a multi-echelon inventory strategies, uh, sub supply chain capacity planning, what fleet size, even demand modeling, forecasting, those types of things. So that's what you would do there. And that type of software you use once a year, you run some models, run some simulations. Okay, so it's not an operational, but a huge amount of value to be unlocked. Uh, and that's typically where you make the big strategic decisions in your business. Here you can see one of the outcomes for a, for a customer that we modeled. This was allocation of customers to various, uh, we, we, to which uh, facilities. Up top was before we walked in, below was afterwards. And you can see the reduction in kilometers work went from 691,000, uh, we're looking at the blue blocks here, to 336,000. So, and that's a very common picture. Just over time, if it's not focused on uh, customers are very often serviced from the wrong area. So that's where you would use strategic modeling. The other big buzzword, uh, creating a lot of confusion out there is this thing called a control tower. What is a control tower? A lot of people ask me, where can I buy one? Well, the sad news is, you know, a logistics control tower, you can't buy. It's not an off the shelf thing. What it is, it's a number of technologies. It's a methodology whereby you're looking end to end from order, order to cash collection, the PODs, everything in between to be housed centrally with integration layers and workflow management specific to your business processes. 
And that's largely what a control tower is and how the control tower functions. And you would have in there many different systems, potentially you're looking at your inventory planning, uh, your, your master data, your, your finance systems, your transport management systems, your CRM systems, all those, all those types of technologies come into play. But very important, integrated, synchronized and workflow management. And that is what, what forms a logistics control tower. Very, very strong linked to effective process management. And if done correctly, you're automating your process management. Other technology out there, TMS, transport management. This is a technology largely used by shippers, i.e. cargo owners, somebody, a brewery for argument's sake, a cement company, a rice company, sending products out, not by transporters. And they would use this to, to manage the order process, to allocate orders to a number of transporters, to track where they are in the process, to make the payments and to do the claims management side. New, new technologies coming to the fore now, execution management technologies. Uh, there's a saying that says a, a, a good strategy poorly implemented is worse than a poor strategy well executed or well implemented. Well, that's why these tools are coming into play. Uh, one of these tools is a tool called Trip Director, which really starts to give you visibility across uh, all the different workflow paths and over here, you can see a couple of the outputs of a tool such as this that gives you snapshots, how we're we doing at collections, what percentage, how we're we doing on deliveries, um, what is the delivery profile, what vehicle coverage have I got, how many loads are out, how many PODs are returned. So again, empowering the control tower to have that. So that's, that's, that's something new that's coming to the fore at the moment. Routing and scheduling tools. Well, those are tools that are largely used in the secondary distribution environment and largely used by transporters themselves. And why are they used? Well, it's simple. It's a mathematic calculation. It's just around complexity. So if you've got two orders to deliver, you can do it on the back. You, you can do it in your head. Three, potentially in your head. A few more, back of a cigarette box, and then it gets complicated. Let me explain. So if I've got two orders, that's two drops, quite easy. If I've got three, then it's the, the equation goes in terms of the number of possibilities is one times two times three, which is six. All right, if I've got six orders, I've got 4,320 different ways that I can execute those six orders. Now, that's starting to get out the point of kind of uh, the, the normal human brain capacity. And when you've got 10 orders, there's 3.6 million different permutations as to the order in which you can deliver those. And you want to try and do them on a lowest cost basis, uh, lowest cost being lowest amount of kilometers. And this is typically what one of those systems do. You've got your, your DC in the middle by the red dot. All the other purple dots are customers and you say, well, I need to get all those deliveries done today. It runs an algorithm, it runs a model and you get one of these flower petal type uh, uh, networks. And then this, is the, this, one, this particular one ran against the traditional plan versus the algorithmic one and saved 38% on kilometers. So that's where you'd use those kind of tools. And a really another nice sexy piece of tool that's coming into play, largely enabled by the smartphone and uh, lowering cost of data, is mobile type solutions, managing workflows, etc. So these type of solutions allow you to scan parcels, boxes, cargo onto vehicles, scan them off vehicles, multi-drops, turn-by-turn navigations, uh, claims, taking photos, EPODs, sign-on glass, protection with um, SMS passcodes and the likes of that, and the, obviously the, the, the MIS or, or the management information attached to that. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a, a view in terms of, uh, sorry, I forgot one more, fleet management software. Um, this is largely used by transporters or only used by transporters. Uh, piece of kit that's, that's placed in the vehicle. Uh, satellite tracks and can track any number of things and the, the, the operators um, sort of manage and track the vehicles around that. So that's a bit of a spectrum of, of, the, of the software that ex exists within the logistics space. And each one of these is probably a deep dive and a two hour discussion of, of, of them. So in the last 15 minutes, what I'm gonna share with you is I'm gonna share with you a case study where what we've gone through very quickly has all come together quite nicely. Okay, so where business strategy, logistics strategy, and technology meet to, 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 change, uh, to change a route to market strategy materially. Okay, so what is this case study about? Well, this case study is about a cement company in Rwanda that was uh, producing 100,000 tons of cement and was selling the, that cement to the area directly around it. So in its natural zone of competitiveness, in a town called Bugarama, which is about 300 kilometers south of Kigali. 
Now, a significant investment was that cement was also sold through a distributor network. So the factory produced, distributors bought, and the producer didn't know where the cement was going. The distributors held all the power. Um, I think you're probably familiar with the term cement barons. Uh, I think you probably get them in, in, in other commodities as well. Uh, and they, they choose which cement they're going to buy, and they will also choose to, to which customers it goes. And they generally distributors and traders, and they may today be doing cement and tomorrow be doing rice because rice pays more. If there's some UN work to be done, that pays even more. So they would drop that. So as a cement producer, you're never really in charge of how you're going to sell and how much you're going to sell. And you're really uh, beholden to these distributors. So they were then going from 100,000 tons per annum production to 600,000 tons. And that was almost a, a switch, but probably. And, they, and then they needed to kind of figure out, well, how are we going to sell that extra capacity? Um, and they could go to the distributors. And do the distributors have the cash flows to do that? Do they have the reach? Do they have the trucks? Um, and then the, the strategy was, and again, this is now the business strategy, saying we, we actually need the business strategy. We have to sell 600,000 tons. And we need to sell it as business strategy saying that we want to have a relationship as close to the wheelbarrow as possible. So we don't want to stop the relationship with the distributor. We want to know who the cement is going to, if it's going to the retailer or the construction site um, or to a concrete product manufacturer. We want to know, which, we want to have that relationship because once we have that relationship, we can influence sales. So we could influence sales. We could run a promotion or activation event in a, a, a specific area or town that we want to, to focus sales on or we could um, do a price adjustment or whatever the case might be. We could uh, introduce rebate structures that work for them. So that was it. So largely meant the determination of distributors. So let's take a look. The company is a company called Samawa. There's the old plant, there's the new plant and the bit of the problem statement, which, I, which I've sketched already. The, the, one of the key things is the Kigali market is the biggest market. 14 hours away by truck uh, from uh, from Bugarama. Interestingly enough, if you take a, do do the Google Maps thing, five hours 39 minutes. Yeah, don't always believe Google Maps. All right, so if you're doing a desktop study, just uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, and and the traditionally the cement was was distributed by and this is something I've come across across in a number of countries an, an association. So it's not a legislated association just the industry body that's come across and, and, and created some form of almost type of cartel. Now, the unfortunate thing that is that this, this particular association uh, was termed RHCAD, which stood for Rwanda HEMA Cement Active Dealers. Now, anybody who understands anything about the cement industry will know that HEMA would have been Samaba's uh, direct competitor. Very difficult to, to, to uh, use someone who's got your competitor's name in, as your distribution wing. So we needed to find a way to, to uh, get, get directly into the, um, into the market and into the customer place. Uh, and the, this, this club dictated who sold to where uh, and something that we had to get around. So if we then took a look at this, if you look at the top part of the graphic, you'll see who did what in the supply chain. So we've got the current state, we've got all the components of the supply chain there. The distributor just didn't manufacture, but did everything else in the supply chain. They sold, they offered credit, they transported. Some of them did lake transport, warehousing, uh, and uh, collected the cash. Uh, whereas the cement manufacturer manufactured and only sold to the distributor and collected cash. Did nothing in between. Okay, the, the, that in itself becomes quite a challenge because there's a couple of pit, pitfalls and problems around that. So if you're selling through a distributor, what, is the, what, are, the, what are the pitfalls around that? One, you're disintermediated. You have no relationship with your end customer. There's an additional cost layer of someone in the supply chain. Granted, they do do something for that. Um, limited control of the pricing. You, 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 you can just sell X gate and, and that's it. And generally, you get pushed for bigger and bigger rebates, bonuses, call it what you like. A very high exposure to a small customer base. So if you're selling to seven or eight cement barons, um, your, your whole business case is built on eight customers. And if a competitor takes four of them away, you've lost 50% of your, of your margin straight away. Uh, limited ability to increase sales and the sales are dependent on the distributor's cash flows. And we'd seen it many times where a distributor's cash flow is tied up. He hasn't got paid for a, a shipment of rice or something to that effect. He can no longer buy from you um, and your sales take a dive. Okay, so the focus of saying, well, what if, if, 
if we then, as Samarabad, offered a delivered service direct to the clients, well, you're able to, inf it's all the opposite of the pitfalls, I guess. So the ability to influence sales volumes, you can now direct control of that, a direct relationship with a customer so that you can build a, a relationship and a long-term relationship. And you're also able to define service levels because up until now, you can only sort of sell it at the gate. And if a customer wants your product, it depends on how good the distributors or how well they can get it to you. So, but now because you're delivering, you can define your own service levels. Um, ability to do loyalty programs or rebate programs with the end user as close to the wheelbarrow as possible. And you can diversify your customer base. All right, so you're not all linked into one segment and direct control over market pricing as well. So a lot of benefits clearly. So then if we, we take the top, the top part of the graphic was that's how, how the supply chain was. The bottom part, we, we, we'd realized that Samava needs to play a far bigger role in the supply chain. It needs to sell to the multiple customers, needs to have the ability to offer credit, needs to have the ability to transport. So this is all part of the business strategy we're talking about. The strategy was we don't, we're not a Navy. We're not going to get into owning boats and lakes and lake transport. And we're not going to do the, the warehousing. We're not going to do the small loads. So a very specific space. There is a need for a distributor. Distributors who can solve that problem for us, we will keep. And then obviously the collection of cash. Okay. All right. So then how did we go about the implementation process? Well, the very first thing was getting the business aligned. You know, some parts in the business that said, well, cement sold itself. Uh, very often you get that kind of uh, volume out there. Cement can be naughty and not sell itself. And then you've got to take control of that supply chain and, and put the things in place to make sure that the cement sells itself. So how did we make sure that the cement that wasn't selling itself got sold? We put in an increase in terms of the sales focus, increase the sales reps from two to six. Remember, you're taking over some of the work that the distributor was doing uh, in that process, uh, increase the, 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 the sales office hours, uh, in, uh, introduce credits, managed activation, promotion events, uh, reduce turnaround times at the factory. So that's that, 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 that circle we talked about earlier on. You, you really got to make it easier to buy from yourself than from anybody else. Uh, and historically, a lot of cement companies had these huge queues. A truck would wait two days, three days outside there. Um, and that's how it was. But you, you've got to change the mindset. There's a cost. A truck stands for a day. It costs you $200. It's costing someone $200 a day for that truck to stand there. And then the value proposition, you know, it enabled, uh, enabled the customer to go to, to retail stores, to do branding, to offer promotional events, storage, technical support, overalls, the, the likes of that. Then we redefined the distributor role. We kept the distributors where it made sense, where they had boat transport, where they had warehousing, and they had the ability to deliver small vehicles. So less than 350 50 bags. And then from a pricing point of view, a radical restructuring of the rebate. So historically, the, the rebate table was very heavily weighted to the distributors. And it only kicked in if you used 1,000 tons or more. And then what was happening, there was a price war happening between the distributors within the same company with the same product. Imagine that. Um, so everybody was at the MD's door, knocking on the door saying, I want a bigger bonus rebate than the other guy. Um, and you can see on the graph below, the orange line is, is how the rebate had shot up over time. How we then reduced the rebate and where the blue square is, that is when the strategy had kicked in. We brought the rebate right down. Okay, and you can see how the volumes increased. So by paying less to the distributors, uh, making the rebate accessible to a broader base of people, but smaller bands, the volumes increased. Okay, now that, so kind of a win-win for all, except of course, if you're a distributor, but we didn't forget about the distributor. We took two of the distributors and we transitioned them into transporters. Very, very important part. They were key in the process. They'd been part of the, the, the company's success and we'd repurposed them and it worked well for them. Um, it worked particularly well for them because they are transporters at heart and they were finding cargo such as cement to keep their wheels moving. We now said, okay, sign over all your customers to, to us. And what we will then do is we will pay you as a transporter. We will give you dedicated loads to do. Um, and we actually changed the business model and bought uh, these transporters on board. So, what else did we do in the logistics space? We implemented a transportation management system. So like I mentioned earlier, a full transport management system. Why did we do that? Because we didn't, but the strategy didn't say buy a fleet. 
because you buy a fleet of 30, 40 vehicles, you tie up all the capital and you could rather invest that capital in your production facility or in your inventory. So the, the strategy was to, to implement a transport strategy uh, management system. We then went to market. We, we went uh, and, and we procured transporters in line with the strategy. We procured new trucks. We signed three year contracts, which is also something that was never heard of. Everyone is always on a month to month contract. And why did we sign three year contracts? Hey, the factories in Bugarama, the markets in Kigali, the two are not going to get closer. Okay. What is the phobia of signing the contract? If your contract is structured correctly, the trucks are an extension of your supply chain. 80% of the volume is sold in, in, in Kigali. You are going to need to get trucks to get you there. Secure that capacity. Don't dial for diesel. And then how do you contract it correctly? So importantly, we developed the local transporter base. Right. We didn't bring in transporters from South Africa or anywhere else. We took Rwandan companies and we developed and we enhanced them. Um, we, we introduced the dedicated fleet with lower carbon emissions. And what we did as well, and I go back to that circle again here. Um, when, when I got there and I spoke to this transporter, I said, I said to this gentleman, I said to him, I've got a vision. I want to do 20, 20 trips a day from Bugarama to Kigali. And he said to me, you're mad. We're currently lucky if we get eight. Well, guess what? What we're doing at the moment is anywhere between 16 and 20, 20 trips a day with a truck. And because we're paying on a fixed and variable type basis, as the model we took earlier on, the more, the more trips that happen per month, the lower the cost per ton, ton comes down. And everybody's playing their role in terms of reducing that. What do I mean by that? The turnaround time at the factory is getting focused. The turnaround time at the customer is being focused. It's being measured and re receiving attention. We also introduced something called the virtual warehouse. Because uh, Bugarama is so far from, from Kigali, we needed to find a way to, and, and we didn't want to create warehouses in Kigali because warehouses attract cost, product gets broken, product gets stolen. So what we did was we, we, we then said, look, every day you're going to sell 10 loads in Kigali. So let's dispatch, even if there are no orders, but where you have an ERP system such as SAP, it's very rigid, doesn't allow. So what we did is we created a virtual warehouse in SAP. So we dispatched to the virtual warehouse uh, in the transport management system. And then from the virtual warehouse, we re-dispatch again to the, to the customer. So what does it do? It allows you to get a, a product to a customer within two to four hours where if you have to drive from, from the factory itself, that's 14 hours and your vehicle may have been in, 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 uh, in Kigali to start with. So that's probably a three day turnaround. Before the project started, it took the customer probably eight days to get it from when they placed the order to when they, they got the product. Now you can get it within four hours. Again, your route to market strategy. You want to make the product available. What else did we do from a marketing point of view? There was a whole rebranding, the easy way to do business, all that, that, that combined. So again, the business strategy was to increase, increase volumes and capacity. The sales and marketing strategy then supported that by rebranding, by making doing business a lot easier. And the logistics strategy then was, was underpinning that by having a dedicated fleet, by uh, introducing, a uh, sweating that asset. We brought the transport cost down from 1,500 francs a bag to 1,100 francs a bag. Uh, and that, that cost we've managed to keep consistent. And that is through efficiencies. That's not through driving a profit, uh, transporter's profit, profit down, it's through efficiencies. We also focused on the return loads um, of getting clink, uh, of clinker and coal coming in. A lot of that clink and coal was coming in, in via, from Tanzania via through Burundi. We changed that channel and brought it up around through the top, uh, through, through Kigali, drop, dropped it off and then on the way back, we were then on the back hauls, uh, taking cement back on the back of the same trucks. But the only reason we could do that because those trucks initially were, before we did the strategy, were Tanzanian based. And because of uh, cabotage rules, they weren't allowed to pick up and drop off cement in Rwanda. So we changed that to Rwandese based trucks that went and collected the coal. So again, the strategy was go and collect coal, Rwandese based trucks, but then cabotage rules don't apply within Rwanda. And the, and, the, and the load could be dropped off. Again, you set up your systems and your process to do that. So what were the results that we achieved? Well, increased sales from 10,000 to 35,000. I think we had a record month uh, last month of 42,000 odd, odd tons at the client. Uh, ensure product availability in Kigali at the lowest cost. So we managed to do that. Reduce the dependency on the distributor model. 
uh, provided customers with a d direct delivery service. And we found that the customers were actually a lot more comfortable paying money into a large corporate account than what they were dealing with distributors. And we grew the customer base significantly from 50 odd customers to over 500, which created, uh, reduced the risk significantly in terms of uh, exposure to a single large customer base. So what are the key findings out of that? Well, first of all, it wasn't, we're gonna hope to sell the additional. Hope is not a strategy. We've said that before, we'll say it again and again. So took control of the supply chain, understood the business strategy, under, understood the sales strategy, understood the raw material inbound strategy, um, and, and put a logistics and transport strategy in place. And we're bold. We, we, we contracted in new vehicles. We changed the vehicle type. In fact, when we, before the project started, all the, via, all the cement was uh, transported on rigid and drawbar box on the back type vehicles. I'm sure you've come across those. Um, and within a period of eight months, all cement, well, no cement now is that all cement is done on a, on a triaxle flat deck because for that specific application, it is the best product or the best equipment to load and to offload for speed of loading and, and, and speed of offloading. Um, so yeah, that just showed us that a well thought through route to market strategy supported by effective logistics process is crucial to changing the rules of the game and the rules of the game are changing. Um, in, 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 in East Africa. So that's the, um, that's the, 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 the kind of key findings. Bernard, I'm quite happy to report that uh, bang on seven o'clock and um, I've managed to get through the 79 slides and I hope, I hope, I really hope that uh, I've managed to keep uh, the audience with me and I haven't lost you along the way. So uh, Bernard, really happy. I'm hoping there are some questions that have come up. Uh, if not, uh, if you could please facilitate and, and let's see if there are any questions. And I'm not going to say I got all the answers, but if I, if I can answer them, I will. If not, I'll take note of them and get back to you on that. Thank you, Kasten. I am trying to figure out if the, the other Rose Sang in, in this call is now settled. She does very well with the, these questions. But uh, thank you very much for that presentation. I know there are some people who have requested for the for the slides. We will uh, uh, share with you. We will also share the video uh, with Kasten. Uh, please send us an email, uh, info at uh, hop-global.com. I will put it, put it on the chat, and then we'll, we'll organize uh, that one-on-one -on -one with Kasten. So uh, let's go to uh, some questions. In the meantime, Kasten, you can, um, you can be making me um, host so that I can, uh, I can uh, talk to the one that uh, their hands are uh, up. So we have a question from, I don't know the name, it's an anonymous attendee. He says, how do you env envisage supply chains being impacted post COVID, do you foresee more local sourcing, more local production, more local transport, more local goods? But I think this is a question mostly probably for me because it's purchasing. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah, but, but, but in any case, do you see more local solutions post COVID, uh, especially uh, Africa versus China? This is the question. Yeah, Bernard, I, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of changes. Um, I think there's definitely going to be less of a dependence on China to start with. Um, I, th I think certainly a lot of a lot of the the, the global and I'm, I'm talking about sort of globally, a lot of, a lot of people were were left short post COVID because of the long supply chain to China. I, th I think uh, also a large amount of jobs that were lost uh, it will, will factor in, um, you know, the, the focus on, on re looking in terms of. Of production capacity uh, close, closer to home. The other key thing that we're seeing as well is that, um, and particularly in South Africa, we're seeing that a lot of the transport companies are taking strain and a lot of them are shutting down as well. So that is a problem because when we emerge out of COVID uh, in the next two, three years time, if there haven't been enough transport companies that have, uh, that have survived, we're going to find a shortage of transport. 
And to all the shippers, uh, the manufacturers out there who are heavily dependent on transport, I do think it's something that you've got to start putting in your transport strategy hat at the moment and starting to figure out, well, if that is the case and I'm only dealing with ad hoc transporters, I'm going to be exposed. Either I'm going to pay a lot for transport or I'm not going to get my product out there. So should I be considering, uh, I'm not talking about buying a fleet, I'm forming relationships uh, getting some form of contractual long-term dedicated fleet process that's scalable uh, and how do I do that? So I, th I think that is going to be a key, key impact. The world is going to change. The fact that we're doing this, this webinar today and the fact that I'm not in Nairobi presenting it is exactly part of that change as well. Uh, part of what you said, I was going to ask you, do you think organizations uh, who are very transport um, um, uh, intensive should insource uh, should they consider insource all or part of their fleet um, versus uh, having long-term strategic relationships yeah but not I'm, I'm not a big personally I'm not a big fan of insourcing and and the reason for that is that transport's hard it's a hard game it's it's not an easy game and typically you find that the the production mindset uh, and the transport mindset are two different ones just simple things very often linked to we unionize two different unions, two different work hours, work rates. Um, and I, I've yet to find a production company that does, or a manufacturing company that does transport very well. Um, so that's the, the one component. The, the, the other component is it ties up capital, okay? And I think coming out of, uh, a lot of the companies are on a cash preservation strategy at this point in time. So investing in your own fleet will tie up, tie up more capital so rather, rather invest that in inventories and cash flows to keep your business afloat. Um, and then I think the last thing as well is um, if you're looking for scalability, and, and we know that, that most businesses are there are seasonal. The breweries, you know, hotter, hotter months, holiday months sell more than, than in, 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 in the colder months. So again, if you've got your own fleet, how do you deal with seasonal peak? Be, but if, you, if you're contracting in with some good transporters out there who've got a core base fleet of yours, plus they've got other transport you can flex into that fleet. And again, part of your strategy should then be saying, well, how do you do with that? Deal with that. And importantly as well, you know, don't be Oprah Winfrey. You know, you going to Vegas, you going to Vegas, you going to Vegas. That doesn't work. Not every transporter gets a load out there. You've got to have a core set of transporters. One is not a number, so possibly two. So have two transporters. You want competitiveness around service and rates that are your, are your are providing you some key coverage, about 60 to 70% of your capacity, and the rest you play for in the ad hoc space. But I'm not a big fan of insourcing and, and, and buying, buying trucks personally. I know some companies are, but, but for me, that's not, a, that's not probably the smartest way to deal with your, with your cash. We have a question, several questions from um, Alex Musungu. I will try to see if I can merge all his questions into two questions. Uh, so he's in the oil and gas sector, uh, it's a government owned, but generally oil and gas sector, which has both upstream and uh, actually midstream and downstream. So it's finished products. Um, they distribute, they have petrol stations, they have lubricants. And he's, he's asking how can they optimize the distribution of their products uh, in Kenya, they operate in Kenya now. The, the, his other question uh, is uh, concerning theft of the products while en route in the market. Uh, the, the transporter's crew interfere with that. And his last question um, is what kind of SLAs should they look at? So it's, it's an oil and gas sort of total shell. This is national oil and uh, they play in the same league. How can they optimize their distribution, their transport of their products? How can they prevent theft? What kind of SLS will they be looking okay. at? Good. Uh, all three very, very good questions. So optimizing, kind of I know on the inbound, I think uh, in Kenya, if I remember correctly, you've got the pipeline, which is which is bringing product in. Um, so a, a lot of the inbound up until the, re the refineries or the depot storage is, is very optimal in terms of, of, of pipeline. I think the, the opportunities are from there. So, so and, and it's, it's hard to say because I'm not sure how they currently commercially engaged with the, with the transporters, but some of the things that I, I would look, up, look at in that space, it's really about even if you don't own the truck, 
how do you make the tr those trucks do as many kilometers or as many trips or loads loads under uh, under cargo as as possible so you know around transport planning uh, given I know the oil and gas sector has, has got some very strict uh, rules around uh, hours of driving, driving hours, uh, driving into the night, etc. But understanding that environment, are you sweating the assets and how do you currently pay your transporters? And if you're paying them, are, when you're creating more turns on the vehicles and that, is the commercial structure structured in such a way that they are getting the value back, i.e. that, that 2000, 200, 200, 200 example, or they are just paying a fixed fixed fee. Because if you're just paying a fixed fee and you sweat the transporter's assets, he's getting richer. But if you've got a commercial model based on a fixed and variable type model, uh, you'd get some of that that value would accrue accrue back to you. The other things would be, you know, are you are you is your routing and scheduling correct? Um, and I know that certainly in Nairobi, you know, the, are, are you getting into, in, is your planning uh, focused on getting to your furthest point into the center, into the, where, where the areas where the, where the jams are, and then are you working your way back? Are you, you know, how, how many stops is each uh, vehicle doing? Uh, and are you doing kind of the op optimal, optimal route around that? So based on that, that type of routing and scheduling. With regards to theft, uh, there's a lot of uh, that that takes you back to when I looked at those technologies. Um, you know, it's uh, there's there's a lot of technologies and telemetry available. I'm pretty sure that they're probably looking at that. If not, you know, are the trans do the transporters have them on board? And if they don't, you know, I go back to the, the whole strategy around your RFQ. When you go to your RFQ, what are you asking for, and what are the non-negotiables? So the non-negotiables they should have those types of controls in place. Uh, in terms of flow meters linked to telemetry um, that that's providing that back to you your left on board fuel as well um, how, how you how you managing that process I'm guess you're talking about the fuel in the in the bowsers and 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 potentially also the fuel actually there's a big theft component of the fuel on the actual truck tractor or the head as well that, that is used so two different components again with a combination of technologies I know that the fuel on on, on the head uh, there's also some technologies that that can can solve that. Even simple things such as a padlock, you know, can, can do that. But um, other ways to 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 try and balance it with technologies is is also put telemetry systems within the customers so that you can try and get a telemetry reading change of of, of uh, in in the fuel tanks versus what's gone out and try and find a match there if if that is possible. In terms of service level service level agreements. Um, again, that's kind of you want you want to let that drive what you are are, are driving and your customer sales promise, um, and you know the the other key components in that whole 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 network. And I'll take you back to that circle again: is how long is the fuel tanker taking to to load at the fuel centres? And I know sometimes in the fuel space those are common. Um, can you reduce that time? So uh, to me, it's it's on on, on time for loading. On time for delivery, uh, losses would would be key. Uh, even the element of of uh, driver driver behaviour, because the driver is an extension of the business, and the driver probably gets to the forecourt more times than what the sales representative does. So you know those are the kind of, those are the kind of things that I'd be considering putting putting into the service level agreement. Um, contractually, I do know that the. the, the um, the, the, the fuel contracts are, are far more rigorous than general cargo and rightfully so in terms of, of health and safety. And I think health and, health and safety should form a, a very key part of those contracts as well. So I hope I've answered the, that question um, to a large extent. Yes, I know they also do have lubricants, but I'm going to ask another question is asked that, that will be for general um, general audience. But uh, I've seen Rose's uh, hand uh, raised. So Rose, I've allowed you to unmute yourself. I, th I think you wanted to add something to what Kasten was saying. No, no, thanks. He, he did answer the question. So thank you very, very much. OK, great. So then you can just um, uh, mute yourself again. So Kasten, uh, the next question is on strategy. But probably to, to benefit everyone, when making a transport or a logistic strategy, what are some of the top key things that we must look out for, that we must include, especially at this time uh, while uh, the businesses are, are, are tight 
and are looking to, to leverage and unlock some value out of the logistics uh, costs and processes. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, I, I think uh, some of the key things that you want to be considering is, is around transport capacity. So, first of all, you want to be understanding what is your, what is your, what is your capacity that, that you need to supply. And then how are you going to be contracting for that capacity? So you need an element of securing capacity. Um, one's got to make the assumption that there's a point in time that this, this market's going to recover. Okay, so how do you secure that capacity? How do you keep the, your key transporters alive? I think that to me is one of the, the key things playing the long game here. Um, and, and, prob and, and probably around that saying with the limited volume that you've got, what, what, what bets are you going to hedge at this point in time in terms of which transporters and what discussions are you going to have with with them at, at that point in time? I, I do think you want to. I, I do think you want to. Just just one second for me. I, I, I do think you want to. I do think you want to be um, also looking. Um, just sorry, I just got, I've just got a call that I've got to attend to. Um, so I, I do I do think you want you, you want to be looking at um, not not uh, spending too much in terms of capital on that you want to try, kind of make do with what's out there and keep what's out there alive. I do think you want to start sweating the assets of your transporters by consolidating your spend with, with a, a few of transporters that you're going to grow post 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 that event uh, and and select the right ones to do that. Um, so I think those would be some of the key things and I do think as well that the focus it use this time to get the internal processes sorted out within your business. So a, a lot of the times you know, in long queues and delays within your own facilities are, are not so much are not so much linked to uh, facilities and the likes of that but it's actually just linked to processes. So is your process is your admin process your finance process is that aligned so how, how can you use this time while volumes are low? to make your processes slick so that as you grow, you, you have a reduction in your loading times and uh, in, in terms of your customers as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Samuel Okanda, you have your hand raised up. I've allowed you to unmute yourself. Please ask your question. Good evening. Hello, Samuel. Good evening. Yes, my question is if you have contracted a transporter and he's supposed yep. to give you a 10 ton a truck and when he comes to take the goods, the goods are 7 tons, how do you pay that? Okay, so if I, if I understood you correctly, you've contracted a, a, a 3 ton a truck and he's arrived with a 7 ton or just... just, just it is a, 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 10 ton, a 10 ton a truck? Yes. And when it comes, the goods are seven tons. Okay. Yeah. You pay the full contract, or you vary. Okay. That yeah. That that is a very very good point, Samuel. So, again, so so the question, if I understand it, you want to move seven tons of product. The transporter arrives with a ten tonner, so you're only filling his vehicle seventy percent of the time, or seventy percent of this either the by by weight or by volume. What do you pay him? Okay, so if I put my transporter hat on, I say, well, you know what, you've contracted my truck, it's got this much capacity, you've got to pay me the full, you've got to pay me the full, my full fare. From your point of view, you're going to say, well, I actually want to pay you a rate per ton, and I'm only going to pay you seven tons. Okay, but that three tons that's missing, provided there isn't a seven ton vehicle out there, let's assume there's only a 10 ton vehicle out there, that three tons that are, that are, that are missing is lost value in the supply chain. So how do you address that? Well, you potentially want to be, be starting to look at your order size and your order quantities. What a lot of companies do is they have a minimum order quantity or order, order size that you link to your vehicle equipment size because someone's picking up that cost in your supply chain. Maybe not on, maybe not on that particular load, but that transport is going to come and say, okay, that's the last time you're going to catch me, Samuel. Next time I come here, if I know you, I'm coming with a 10 ton and you're only loading me seven tons, I'm going to increase my rate. So that is, that is latent value right there. So, and, and your transporter can't up the order. He could possibly come with a smaller truck, um, but then he needs to have that visibility up front. But then if he doesn't have a smaller truck, you should be contracting somebody 
who has the smaller truck at potentially at the lower rate. So again, you know, that comes right from the start of the process of how's your order management? What are your policies around minimum order sizes? Um, you know, if you let you cement, for example, are you allowed to buy one bag or are you allowed to buy 10 bags or, or when, when does it? And, and, and also simple things such as um, cement for argument's sake, if you're going to sell something and you're going to put, put two, two loads on, on a truck, are you going to make the two loads, are you going to sell your loads in, let's say, 15 tons and 15 tons or 14 and 14, that gives you 28 tons to the maximum capacity of that, of that truck. And you're not going to allow someone to do 24 because to try and sell six is very difficult. So I would also go back into the business and spend some time around the strategy to say, well, how do we price? How do we package certain, certain options available to drive efficiencies through, through the ordering process into the supply chain so that the trucks are fully utilized? And then again, you're going back to those trucks. If you're paying the transporter a fee per ton, uh, he's getting the benefit of the, of the, of the uh, fee per ton if you're increasing the payload. So have you, is part of your strategy to say, okay, Mr. Transporter, we're going to get you up to 10 tons, all the orders of 10 tons, but then I want a sharp, sharp rate for those 10 ton deliveries, because every time you'll get a 10 ton order from me. Thank you very much, Karsten. So uh, as a closing question, and then uh, you can answer this and also give uh, your closing remarks. Um, at this point, one of the easiest things to, for organization and executives to do is to look at cost cutting areas. And one of those things that they always think is a low hanging fruit and is not strategic enough uh, even those that use a lot of logistics is transport. So for supply chain people, supply chain managers, uh, for CFOs, for supply chain directors, what are some of the key cost components they can look at or cost modeling they can have to ensure they're having the optimal uh, transportation cost and that they're not also killing their uh, transporters and is a win-win uh, for, for, for the transporter and win-win for the business and for the customer eventually? Yeah, that's a great question because, um, you know, at this point in time, there's, there's, there is an oversupply of transport. Um, the market's down and transporters are going to be falling over themselves uh, to, 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 to get good rates. You know, so probably a good time now to go to market and, and, and peg some rates but I do think, as I said earlier on, I do think in terms of not playing the field too, you can play the field too wide, but you've got to think the long term, we are going to get out of COVID. Business will, will bounce back. It is the same as in nature as if you have a, if you, COVID to me is like a large a fire that is, is swept through the, the, the felt or the forest. It looks all dead. Uh, after the first rains, it all comes back up again. And business is very much resilient and will come back again. So it's balancing that what are you doing now and how does that going to set you up for the future? So to me, it's yes, everybody's taking strain and, 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 and the transporters can't be enjoying the, the traditional fees while everyone else is taking strain. So they will come down with you, but be strategic, select certain transporters who, who've served you well, select the professional ones. This is, are they going to pull through this time of process um, consolidate your spend with fewer transporters rather than more, make sure that they survive and start having discussions with them around, well, once the market comes back, how are we, how are we jointly going to service that market and how are you going to, I'm going to help you through this process now by giving you volume how, and, and dedicating more volume to you than spreading the, the, the market wide because I'm going to ensure your survival. But then when the volume comes back, how do I know that when the volume comes back, you're not going to give me unfair price increases or you're not going to invest in vehicles. So start having those discussions and start contracting around, around that uh, at this point in time. And, and the other component is, the other way to, 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 to make them profitable is to make sure that you utilize their vehicles well again, you know, in that, that circle again. Make sure you load them quickly, make sure you offload them quickly. And, and if you can, uh, pay, them on, pay them on time as well. I think a lot of transporters at this point in time have got tremendous cash flow issues, accounts frozen, et cetera. Um, and just by virtue of, of, of paying them on time, that certainly helps keeping them afloat and alive. Thank you very much, Kasten. Um, 
do you want to say something uh, as your last remarks and, and the recommendations um, to the team going forward before I close? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, just uh, final remarks. Thank you, thank you for uh, um, indulging me over this last hour and a half. Um, I hope you found it valuable. I do, uh, I do think um, you know, be positive. Uh, we will emerge from COVID. Start to start to get your head around how we going, how you're going to be able to deliver. And I do think, you know, that that circle that I spoke about, think about in your supply chain, all those components. Um, and if you apply value stream mapping type methodology everywhere where these efficiencies, take them out and then look at how do you start to capture that value? How is there an alignment between the efficiencies and how you contract and the business strategy and the transport strategy? And I think if you do that, uh, you'll be very well set to emerge out of this crisis, uh, stronger and better and sharper and uh, use this opportunity to forge stronger relationships with your key transporters and service providers. You're going to need them going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. David Basweti, I can see your hand raised up. Please uh, just drop me an email. I'll be able to organize a one-on-one -on -one session with Kasten, uh, same as everybody else. Alex, I, I saw you had a lot of questions. Please let me uh, organize for a meeting between you and Kasten and the team. They have fantastic solutions and they deliver results uh, that impact your bottom line and also your cash flow, especially at this uh, critical moment. Well, thank you always for, for joining us. I hope today that you learned something that is relevant, applicable, and that can impact your business uh, and also impact your own uh, strategy development at this point. I think most importantly, what Kasten said is that during this time that the volume is low and the intensity of logistics and transport is a bit low, use it to review your strategy, re-engage your suppliers, re review your internal processes, link in with procurement, link in with supply chain, review your all S and OP processes, which is sort of the control tower uh, that Kasten had, had put out there, so that when you come out of this, you come out of it ready to, to, to fire. Uh, there are definitely industries that will pick up very fast, like uh, the oil and gas industry, where the economy opens, that, that opens. The social sort of industry, the consumer packaged goods and FMCGs, um, the retail sector, the pharmaceutical and healthcare. So I, I, I guess in looking at your criticality, you need to move with speed and see how you can develop a strategy that will be impactful on your, to your business. Thank you very much, everyone. Look out for our upcoming webinars. Uh, we appreciate you. Have a good evening and God bless you. Thank you.